Good morning. I'd say it's good to see you all, but I can't see you. But I'm glad that you're tuning in to watch the service. If you would just bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together, even if it's over the internet. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit being with us. We ask, Lord, to, for an openness to your spirit and to the truth that we're going to hear today. We just thank you so much for guiding and directing us in our lives. We thank you for the time to worship you and just to give you glory, honor, and praise. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Morning. We're glad everyone can join us uh, on this wintry morning. We're going to sing first the solid rock. We're going to sing all verses of the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I sin, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground. Sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his changing grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I sit. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Before I have our morning prayer, we're going to sing, uh, It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful what the Lord has done. He pardoned my transgression. He sanctified my soul. He honors my confession. Since by his blood I'm whole. It is truly wonderful what the Lord has done. It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful what the Lord has done. Glory to his name. He brings me through affliction. He leaves me not alone. He's with me in temptation. He keeps me for his own. It is truly wonderful what the Lord has done. It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful what the Lord has done. Glory to his name. He keeps me firm and faithful. His love I do enjoy. For this I shall be grateful and live in his employ. It is truly wonderful what 
the Lord has done. It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful. It is truly wonderful what the Lord has done. Glory to His name. If you would bow with me as we go to prayer. Lord, we come before you with many needs. You know, Lord, that each one of us are a needy people. You created us that way, Lord. By design, you made us to need you. Help us to turn to you in our times of need for all of our needs. Help us to acknowledge you. Lord, we come before you for the prayer and lifting up the needs of other people, the many that are in our prayer bulletin, and Lord, we're coming to you not because of our righteousness, but because of your mercy, as Daniel says. Lord, we, we just thank you so much for your mercy and your goodness. So we lift up these concerns, Lord, those who are battling cancer, those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are sick, who are preparing for surgery or recovering from surgery. We pray for those, Lord, who maybe are depressed or have anxiety, they're dealing with the relational issues, Lord. We just lift all these up to you, Lord Jesus. We also pray for those who are unsaved. We pray for those who are lost out there in the world, Lord, who haven't experienced your hope and your forgiveness and the relief that comes from giving over our sins to you and confessing those sins and repenting of them and believing on you, Jesus. We just pray for those people, Lord. We know different people, whether they're family or friends or neighbors or coworkers or classmates, Lord, Whoever they may be, Lord, in our lives, we just pray for them that they be turning to you. Help us to be your hands and your feet, Lord. Help us to be sharing your love with them through our words and our actions. Showing them, Lord, how much you love them and care for them. That they would truly turn their hearts and lives over to you. We thank you so much for the opportunities to serve and to be your church. Help us, Lord, not to just keep that to ourselves, but to freely give what you've freely given us through your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done on the cross. We pray these things in your precious holy name. Amen. Before I go to the sermon, I want to read the scripture for this week, and it's 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and in the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will be able who will be who will also be qualified to teach others endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs he wants to please his commanding officer similarly if anyone competes as an athlete he does so to receive the victor's crown and he does not he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Christ Jesus, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a, crum like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we also will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and, no, and it only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among, among them are Harmonius and Philelius who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, 
he will be an instrument of noble purpose, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolishness and stupid arguments, because you know they produce quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Again, that was 2 Timothy chapter 2. We go into the sermon. For the month of January, we have been looking at life. We've had this series on life, and it's to coincide with the 1973 Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade, which made abortion legal. On Sunday the 3rd, we looked at life in general, and I stated we should hold all human life as precious because life is from God. God created all life, and he created all human life in his image. Because of this, humans are the pinnacle of God's creation. From the unborn to the elderly, all human life is precious. On Sunday the 10th, we looked at how babies are precious to God, and I stated... In the Bible, we can see babies are precious to God. God was not just interested in the adults that he could use for his purpose and will here on earth, but he's also interested in the infants. Why? Because they were made and created in his image. Every one of the heroes of the Bible were babies at one time. Some had miraculous beginnings, while others had very ordinary beginnings. On Sunday the 17th, we looked at the value of the elderly, and I stated, from the Bible, we can learn to value the elderly. Elderly people have value, even when they can no longer make what the world would consider significant contributions to society. We don't have value because of what we can contribute to society. We have value because we're created in God's image. So even when a person who would be considered less than valuable because they can no longer add anything the world would consider a significant contribution to society, they still have value. On September 24th, we looked at sanctifying or sacrificing our children, and I stated in the Bible we can see God is opposed to sacrificing our children. When we sacrifice our children, our unborn children, through abortion, we are sacrificing them to the gods of convenience, pride, selfishness, and the like. It grieves God and hurts Him deeply when we sacrifice our unborn children. And I also shared that there is forgiveness from our sins, even the sin of abortion. In all of these sermons, I talked about and focused on physical life, but I also talked about spiritual life. And today I want to focus more on spiritual life. As Christians, we should be making disciples. Our text for today is found in Matthew chapter 28. That's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew's the first book in the New Testament, first of the four Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And our text reads, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So for some context, we need to look at verses 16 and 17 here in Matthew 28. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. So the disciples were told by Jesus to go to a certain mountain in Galilee, and they met Jesus there and they worshiped him. When Jesus speaks to them, and then Jesus speaks to them to the words of our text. Now, when this happened, we don't exactly know, but it was after his resurrection and before his ascension. In Matthew and John, we don't read about Jesus' ascension, but in Mark and Luke, we do. We also have recorded his ascension in the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts was written by the physician Luke, and that's the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. Here in Acts chapter 1, or yeah, Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Luke writes, After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, it could be that our text happened during these 40 days that Luke writes of. In our text, we have no account of Jesus ascending, 
So I think we can conclude that he didn't ascend after sharing these words with his disciples. Now, one commentary stated that this meeting on the mountain of Galilee could have also been not just with the 11 disciples, but with the 500 followers that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And the reasoning they give for this is that on the mountain, there would have been plenty of room for 500 people. It also would have been away from the watchful eye of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. And having spent much of his time in the region of Galilee, Jesus would have had many more followers in that area than in Jerusalem. Now, this is basically just speculation because we have no way of knowing for sure, but it is a possibility. So now let's look at our text. Verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus here makes a very powerful statement. All authority has been given to him. All authority. Not just some authority, but all authority. Authority over what? Authority in heaven and in earth. Jesus doesn't just have all authority over earth or all authority over heaven, but both. What Jesus is saying here to his Jewish followers is that he is the Lord God. If he was not, he could not claim all authority over heaven and earth. Now, if this was not true, then Jesus is committing blasphemy against the Lord God. And one of the main arguments that the Jewish religious leaders and the rulers had against Jesus was that he claimed to be God. Such a claim was blasphemy and punishable by death, unless you truly were God. In Jesus' defense, he claimed that this in his defense against the blasphemy, he claimed was his miracles. In fact, he lamented about several cities and the people in those cities and their failure not to believe his miracles as proof that he was God. The religious leaders didn't want to believe him and his miracles, and they said that his miracles were from the devil. In fact, this apparent blasphemy of claiming that he was God was what Jesus was convicted for and sentenced to death for. But Jesus was not committing blasphemy because he was truly God. He was God in human form. He was the Christ, the Messiah. And after his sacrificial death and resurrection, he earned the right to have all authority given to him. Now, in speaking of this authority in heaven, Jesus was not just talking about heaven itself, but he was talking about the spiritual realm. Paul gives us a little insight to what this realm contains in Ephesians 6, 12, when he states, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Jesus had authority over all of these. He also had authority over all the earth. In Colossians 1.17, Paul writes this of Jesus, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, science will tell us that gravity is what holds all things together, but in truth, it's Jesus. In Ephesians 1.22, Paul writes this about Jesus, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Adam Clark, in his commentary, states this about Jesus' authority. He states, and I quote, his having authority or right in heaven to send down the Holy Spirit, to raise up his followers thither, to crown them in the kingdom of an endless glory, in earth to convert sinners, to sanctify, protect, and perfect his, perfect his church, to subdue all nations to himself, and finally to judge all mankind, end quote. With this authority, Jesus is sending his followers out. And that's what we read here in verses 19 and 20. When he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus' command here is go. Where or we are to go. We are to be active in Jesus' directive. What, is, what are we to go and do? What is Jesus' directive? It's to make disciples, baptize them, and to teach them to obey. Now, before we look at this directive, in detail, I want to talk about who it was Jesus' followers were to go and make disciples of. Our text says all nations. Jesus' followers were not just to go and make disciples of the other Israelites, but they were also to go to all the nations and make disciples. And I'm thankful that Jesus included Gentiles in this directive. Otherwise, most all of us would not be included. We are also to go and make disciples of all nations. And we have many missionaries in other countries doing just that. We should be open to God calling us to go to other nations and make disciples. 
And if we're not called, then we should be supporting those who have been called. Now, living here in Wabash and in Indiana, we don't have a large diversity of people from other nations living around us, but that is slowly changing. And we should be watchful of people who come to live in our community who are from other nations, watchful so that we can befriend them and make disciples of them. Now, we shouldn't befriend them just to make disciples of them. That mindset is more along the lines of focusing only on converts, and we will look at that more in a moment. We should befriend them because they are precious lives created in God's image, and God loves them just as much as he loves you and me. Moving into a new community is hard, but add to that the fact that you are from another nation and another culture and probably speak a different language, and it makes it even harder. These people will need people to befriend them and help them. And in helping them, we are being Jesus to them. And after experiencing our help, they will be open to learning about Jesus. And this would be the start of a discipleship, even if it's in an informal way. So let's go back to the directive. Go and make disciples. Jesus did not say go and make converts. He said go and make disciples. Is there a difference between a disciple and a convert? Well, spiritually speaking, not really. But when, we focus, but when the focus is on making converts, it's short-sighted. It's a short-sighted focus because once a person becomes a convert, the goal is reached or completed, and it's time to move on to a new person to make them a convert. But the new convert is, well, he's new, or they're new. And they are new to the faith, and they need to be discipled and to grow in their faith. But unfortunately, many churches only focus on conversions and not discipleship because conversion is the goal, not discipleship. Now, most churches have some kind of discipleship programs. They could be intentional discipleship classes or groups, or it could just be their Sunday school classes. But again, it's not the main goal, so most of the time it's up to the individual, the new convert, to make or take the steps to be discipled. And this often doesn't happen because many people believe once they have been had a conversion experience that they're good to go and really don't need to be discipled. And this is because they see the goal as conversion and not discipleship. For many years, our churches and our pastors have operated in this way. And our church and myself are no exception. This is the way I was taught and trained, that our goal is conversions. But many churches, ours included, can see that it's not working like it did at one time. And I'm thinking, even though it did seem to work at one time, did we really have disciples or did, you just, did we just have converts who were pew sitters. Now, an Indiana pastor from the Church of God made a statement at the Indiana State Minister's Meeting last October. And this isn't a direct quote, but he said something to the, along these lines. I've spent most of the, the years of my ministry focused on making converts, but now I'm focused on making disciples who make disciples. And that pastor was Terry Canfield. Those of you who don't recognize this name, he was the previous pastor for this congregation for around 11 years. I want to stop here and say a little about what a disciple is. Here's the definition of disciple from my word processor's dictionary. A follower or public, a follower or pupil of a teacher, leader, or philosophy. From this definition, we can see that there can be many disciples of many people or trains of thought. But most of the time when we think of disciple, we think of Jesus. Now in the Bible that I have for sermon preparation in my office, I've written in the margin by these verses, which are our text, the words from a sermon that I heard many years ago. And these words were, discipleship is not about what we believe or how fervently we believe it, but what we do. And I believe this agrees with our next definition. It's a definition for disciple that I took from the book, Discipleship That Fits. They state, and I quote, someone who is following Jesus being changed by Jesus and is committed to Jesus' kingdom mission, end quote. To follow Jesus, to be changed by Jesus, and to be committed to Jesus' kingdom mission is to be doing, not just believing. What is Jesus' kingdom mission? It's our text. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Excuse me. So I say to you, that a person technically can be a convert and still not be a disciple. They can be a convert and not be following Jesus or being changed by Jesus and not be committed to Jesus' kingdom mission. Yes, to be a convert, they need to be changed by Jesus and moving from spiritual death to spiritual life, 
but oftentimes that's the only change that takes place. They are not continually changed by Jesus, and they're not focusing on following Jesus, and they're not committed to Jesus' kingdom mission. So why is this? Because when our goal is conversion, the focus is making a decision for Jesus, and we never help them to see that conversion is just a part of a relationship with Jesus and not the only thing. So once they make a decision and convert, they believe and, and we treat them like they have arrived. Church, we need to stop focusing on conversions and start focusing on making disciples. We need to be making disciples who are following Jesus, who are changed by Jesus, and who are committed to Jesus' kingdom mission. Again, what is Jesus' kingdom mission? Matthew 8, or 28, 18 through 20. Jesus' kingdom mission is our text. Jesus' kingdom mission is to go and make disciples. When we make disciples, we are to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we do this by making the goal make, to make disciples, not converts. And the way, this way, people don't believe that they have, all they have to do is convert, and that's all there is. Now, some people will say, well, we need to have evangelism. And yes, we do. But most evangelism nowadays only focuses on converts, not disciples. In the book, Discipleship That Fits, the authors explain how discipleship and evangelism are actually very related. You can start discipling someone before they're a convert. With this discipling, you're actually evangelizing them also. And once a person converts, they are still discipled and evangelism still takes place. In this book, the authors state that evangelism continues in a believer's life or it should continue in a believer's life. Their view of evangelism is that it's sharing or teaching or preaching the teachings of Jesus. And when we read the Bible or we hear a sermon, we are being evangelized even as believers. See, evangelism is not just sharing salvation to non-believers. It's learning more about Jesus. Now, going back to our text, Jesus commands us to baptize. We are to baptize new believers. Once a person has made a profession of faith, they are to be baptized. And this baptism does not save them. Only Jesus' blood saves us from our sins. We're not saved by works either. Baptism is something that we do, so it can't save us. Baptism is just an outward act on our part of an inward act with Jesus in our heart. Baptism is a public display and testimony of our salvation through Jesus. Jesus says that we should baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here Jesus gives us proof of the Trinity, the triune God. We have one God with three distinct parts. An apple can be, can be used to help us to understand this often hard concept. And I believe I shared this a few weeks ago, but I want to share it again with you. When you have an apple, you have the apple peel, you have the meat of the apple, and you have the apple seeds. All three distinct parts, but still all three parts are the apple. One apple, three distinct parts. One God, three distinct parts. Going back to our text, in verse 20, Jesus states, "...in teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you." We're not just to teach people about Jesus, but we're to teach people to obey Jesus also. And this is important. When our focus is on conversions, we mainly teach them about Jesus and what he did for us. The obedient life is secondary to conversion. But in discipleship, we're focused on teaching people not just to know Jesus, but also to obey his teachings. A disciple, is, a disciple who is obeying Jesus' teaching is one who is following Jesus, who is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to Jesus' kingdom mission. Now, a person can only follow Jesus and be changed by Jesus and be committed to Jesus' kingdom mission if he's obeying Jesus' teachings. So as I close, I want to share a little bit about how we disciple. Now, Jesus here in our text is talking to the 11 disciples and maybe as many as 500 more followers. He's addressing them as individuals. The church has not yet been established. So this directive is command, and this command is to go and make disciples is not just for the church, it's for each individual believer. Now the church is included because it's made up of individual believers. But each one of us has, as individual believers have been given this command to go and make disciples. Now some of you might be in discipling people unintentionally. And hopefully Christian parents are discipling their children intentionally. I believe that making disciples is not as foreign a concept as many of us might think. Many churches have focused on con that have focused on conversions have also worked at discipleship, but only after a person is converted. 
many times we have a disciple they have a discipleship class for the people it may be several weeks or even a few months long but once the person goes through this class they are considered discipled but you can't really put a time frame on discipleship because a disciple continues to be a disciple even when they start to disciple someone else and we're all going to be disciples and continue to be disciples until we make that big move to our glorious homes in heaven Many of you who have been a Christian for several years can disciple another person. You may think you're not qualified, but you are. If you have been a Christian for a while, you have learned about the Christian life. You have knowledge and wisdom to share. God's not looking for perfection. Believe me, if he was, I wouldn't be up here preaching to you. And I know it can be fearful when thinking about discipling someone. Around the time I started to date Sherilyn, the pastor of the First Church of God in Napanee, where I attended, asked me if I would connect with a man from the community that had started to attend our congregation. At the time, I was growing spiritually and had established several strong convictions. I had not yet been called into ministry, though I was trying to understand my spiritual gifts and to look to use them. But when the pastor asked me to connect with this gentleman, I was fearful. I felt like I wasn't qualified. So instead of praying about it and asking God for help and taking a leap of faith, I just declined. And I regret not willing to trust God in this and take that leap of faith and connect with this man. You see, if we leave it to ourselves, we will never look to disciple others. We have to take it to the Lord in prayer. We have to ask him for strength and faith and then take that leap of faith to make disciples. And Jesus will be there for us and with us. He says as much here in our text. At the end of verse 20, he says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How is Jesus with us? He's given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power of God living in us and with us, with every believer. And when we disciple people, we don't have to be the experts. We don't have to know everything in the Bible. We can let the Holy Spirit be the teacher. In fact, in one of the discipleship books that I've been reading, that's what they say, that the Holy Spirit is the teacher, and we need to look to Him for understanding and answers. When discipling another person, some of it is doing life together spending time with that person in social settings, with family and other friends, letting them see Christ lived out in your life. And yes, there will be times of failure on your part. This is when you have an opportunity to show grace or to receive grace, mercy and forgiveness and compassion and see those in action. When you have to humble yourself and confess and ask for forgiveness, though uncomfortable and embarrassing, it often speaks volumes to those who are watching. And yes, it is discipleship because you're living out what you're teaching. Now, I want to encourage you to start praying for people who God would bring into your life for you to disciple. Who's in your life that you can share life with? Who's in your life that you can teach about Jesus through your words and actions and through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit? And not only teach them about Jesus, but teach them to obey His commands also. So please take time to pray for this. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we see here the command that Jesus gave us to go and make disciples. Lord, for so many years, we've been focused on making converts, just getting people through this series to, to convert, convert over to Christianity, and that's the goal. But it's not the goal. The goal should be discipleship, making disciples. Help us to change our thinking. Help us to change our goals and to look more at making disciples. We need your help through your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, for this. In your name we pray. Amen. In closing, let's sing, um, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. 
Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Thank you for joining us today. Pray that you would continue to open your heart to the Lord and his direct leading and guiding and that you'd have a blessed week. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Just be with us as we go out this week. Whatever we may do, whatever we, wherever we may go, Lord, help us to be representing you. Help us to be mindful of your spirit with us, that we could be your witness and a blessing to others, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thanks.